Thanks, Keith. Um, so this talk is part semi-factual, part almost completely unsupportable opinion. Um, and just to convince you that I am semi-insane already, I put uh, two pictures that partly illustrate that. One is real serious business on the left, which is the kind of images that we actually need. And you've heard enough geophysical talks now to kind of understand what we kind of do with the physics. And we make pictures of the inside of the Earth. But we do that for a real reason, because there's money down there, quite frankly. And if you can see it, you can potentially get it out. Can't always get it out. In today's terms, you kind of can't make a profit getting it out. But actually, for you guys, the thing that's maybe more interesting and will already convince you that I am completely wacko is my favorite machine of all time. Now, I'm going to contradict myself throughout this talk. So you know, just be ready for that. But uh, of course, I think many of you, looking at the demographics of the audience, I suspect a lot of you know what that is. Is there anybody who doesn't know what that machine is? Don't be afraid to raise your hand. It's a connection machine, CM5. Remember Jurassic Park, right? And you know, the, the guy that was the programmer was really Newman on Seinfeld, you know, and he was kind of like screwing things up. Yeah, OK, so, so in many ways, I was the Newman of BP, because uh, that, was, that was my machine. Um, so actually, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to apologize to Earl and tell him, don't hold Keith accountable for what I'm going to say. <laughs> because Keith actually does pick good speakers. I will be the only exception to that. But he didn't know what I was going to do with this. Right? And so Keith, well, you've known me long enough to know that you know, I may be apt to say just about anything. Um, why did I put that machine on there? Other than the fact it was my favorite machine of all time. It was the last point in time where, at least when I was very active in writing codes, where the way you exploited parallelism was still very sequential in terms of instance. So if you were doing 100,000 experiments, you actually did the 100,000 experiments sequentially. However, the physics inside the machine, which you were doing one instance at a time, was completely globally parallel. And to my knowledge, it's about the last time we really thought about it really that way and only that way. I mean, now it's much more a hybrid. I mean, I realize some of you are using multiple distributed machines to solve a single instance, but then you also scale that across many, many instances as well, just like you know, what you saw in, in the last talk. Uh, so there was kind of a turning point in time you know, when that machine existed. Uh, the second thing is, well, we're just coming off the Olympics, right? Who watched the Olympics? Everybody? Just about everybody? Does the name Katie Ledecky mean anything to you? All right. So although looking at me, you would never know. The only sport that I have any aptitude at all for is swimming. And so I follow swimming in the Olympics pretty closely. And well, you know what Katie Ledecky was doing at the Olympics? She was writing records that will probably eventually be broken, but I don't know by what. Um, and it'll probably take a long time until those records are broken. So actually, probably when Keith took that picture, I was the Katie Ledecky of high performance computing. I was writing records that I think maybe only just now are being broken. And that is the number of gigaflop years per dollar ever achieved. Because Keith bought that machine for a dollar. So it was about a 10 gigaflop machine. That's delivered. That's not peak performance. That's actual delivered performance on running applications. He bought the machine for a dollar. Now, the interesting thing is, I think now if you look at kind of the benchmarks and statistics you guys are showing, we're probably at the verge of breaking that now, right? In terms of you look, you know, you're buying million to $10 million machines and you're approaching kind of the 100, 100 uh, petaflop barrier, you're kind of getting to the point where now my record is going to fall. But I basically held the record for the most gigaflops per year per dollar ever achieved. I will go down, may have already gone down, so maybe some of you are scratching in your notepads right now to prove me. But I don't really care. I'm glad to have the record rewritten. It needs to be rewritten. But uh, anyway, interesting fun facts. All right. So semi-factual stuff. Um, I'll go very quickly through the seismic, seismic imaging story, because you've seen that from, from the other three guys. Um, I'm going to talk about some trends in what we're doing in geophysics, how I see the trends in computing. That's where the opinion stuff's going to start really rolling in. Uh, and then actually, I will probably, in your mind, by the time I get done with that next part, you're going to say, uh, he was on a rant. Um, and actually, I think there are several rants. So if you think it's just one rant, you're wrong. There'll be multiple rants. And then maybe just some slightly more serious potential things that might happen in the future, particularly around the geophysics and kind of the demand that it's going to create for computing. OK, so ha, at least I had an animation of waves propagating. Um, so actually, I'm going to start with the actual picture over there, which is a picture from the Grand Canyon. Uh, I didn't actually take that picture, so I'm not sure I even had permission to show it. But ah, show it to you anyway. 
Sedimentary rocks are layered, right? And it's actually a remarkable and amazing and very beneficial thing that they are layered and that they hold hydrocarbons. Uh, if they were just a jumble of garbage, we could probably ma never make the seismic imaging method work. It is the fact that those layers have large contiguous interfaces between them that allow us to get those coherent reflections off of them. Now, we also image a lot of fine scale stuff as well. I mean, Sfera showed you some beautiful pictures of the detail that we can image as well. But fundamentally, we're sending waves in. They're reflecting off of the rock layers and coming back. One of the things that I'd always loved doing in computing was just doing the forward problem, just simulating the forward physics of acoustic waves, which is basically just like sound waves in the air or sound waves in a liquid, propagating through a simulated earth, bouncing around and coming back and generating the simulated data. Um, it's kind of the first thing you teach anybody when you're teaching them how to do high performance computing in geophysics. You kind of show them the forward problem. Now that actually forward problem is a part of a lot of our data processing as well. Uh, and actually, the interesting thing is that little computation, although it is not running on Earl's laptop in real time, um, if we put a little bit of work into the code and actually got it running on Earl's laptop, it would probably run about in real time. This is 2D, not 3D. Um, the 3D problem obviously doesn't run quite that fast on something the size of a laptop. Maybe if you aggregate one of these big machines, you can run the 3D forward problem about in real time like that. Um, when I first started out in the business, that computation that you're seeing now in that little crummy animated GIF, that was an overnight computation on one of the kind of mini computer with attached array processor machines that were common in the industry back then. Anyway, that's the fun part. So I hope you guys appreciate that picture. Um, like, you know, Scott and Sfera showed you, um, fundamentally what we do is turn those into images of the subsurface because that's how we do our business in the oil and gas business. They, they don't pay us to have fun. They don't pay us to, you know, have fun with the physics and do cool numerical simulations. They pay us because they want to drill wells and they're expecting to find something valuable with those wells. Okay, well, trends in geophysics. Actually, I'm not sure this is a good thing, but our main imaging algorithms are staying relatively stable. In fact, it's maybe an indictment of the scientists, like me, that actually there were kind of the giants of our field who kind of were really kicking into gear kind of in the late 60s, early 70s, through the early 80s. They basically wrote the mathematical descriptions of what we're doing now I mean, they couldn't compute them, certainly not compute them in 3D. Even at that time, they couldn't really compute them in 2D. But they wrote those algorithms in schematic form, if you will, you know, in the late 60s, early 70s. And we haven't really changed them. What we have gotten better at is computing them for real at something like the resolution we want to. Although, like Sfera said, yeah, we are hungry for more resolution all the time. Um, but the physics hasn't changed that much. I, I don't know if that's a good thing. You know, we were recently having some discussions with people doing data analytics, and there's this big kind of debate around physics-based models versus empirical models, right? And so we stay mostly out of that empirical world. We're in the physics-based world. I can't tell you that's actually right. I don't know. But, but that, that is our heritage. That is our history. And I don't see a lot changing it right now. Uh, the thing that is going on that's much more concrete, and I think, and Sfera certainly alluded to it, and Scott did too, data density is going up. We're making more recordings because, hey, we've got good engineers who can go out there and build physical systems that record and generate sound waves, and they can build them with more channels, and they can build them more cost effectively. They can deploy those things you know, in various places on the earth, and we can make good use of that. So even though the industry is actually in the crapper right now, data density is still going up. Our key's computing budget's not going up, <laughs> but uh, I guess it's okay if I tell them that. Um, but uh, yeah, no, data density is going up anyway. Um, hey, I think Sarah and I, we got an equation that agrees. Um, I think he said resolution goes like f to the fourth. Yeah, that's the way I would see it. Um, actually, there might be somebody who might, might make a case that says it actually goes worse than that. Because if you actually want pre-stack resolution on some of the offset or angle axes, it might actually go like worse than f to the fourth. But it certainly kind of goes at least as bad as f to the fourth. And that's a bad cost curve to have to climb. Okay, so kind of here's what they are. And, you know, Sfera showed them to you. Scott alluded to some of them as well. And the, and the talk you just saw was kind of littered with a description of these things. Um, we solve hyperbolic PDEs, basically. Linear hyperbolic PDEs, which is so nice because it is something that doesn't require anybody beyond sophomore level college numerical analysis to solve. Now, to get them industrially, you know, robust and really accurate and all those, minor, you know, tweaks and things in there, okay, yeah, no, you got to do some more work. But to write your very first acoustic wave propagation solver, I did it on a Commodore 64 when I was a senior in high school. So it's not really that tough. There actually are some people out there solving the, the wave equation in Fourier transform over time. So they're solving what is actually an elliptic PDE. It's the Helmholtz equation. 
That one is a pain to solve. Doesn't mean some people aren't doing it, because there's actually a good computational reason for wanting to do that. Uh, but that one, because it has dense linear algebra, will, you know, I mean, remember our kind of problem sizes are like a gigapixel, right? So when you've got a system of linear equations that's of size 10 to the 18th, you've got a problem, right? But that doesn't mean some people aren't trying, right? I'm, I'm just not sure they're commercially successful at it. If they are, they're being quiet about it. Uh, we gave it a shot and decided there was a better way of doing it. We just went back to the time domain solvers. Um, elastic wave propagation is now coming into our world. Now you wonder, like, oh, what's the difference? Well, we actually treat the Earth, it, everything that Sphera showed you, <laughs> treated the Earth not as just the ocean was a liquid, but the whole Earth was a liquid. That's the way he's actually treating it. Me too, I'm just as guilty as he is. But actually, you know, what you saw the... You know, the previous talk showed uh, some of Jerome Tromp's work doing whole Earth seismology. Yeah, they would, they would just, you know, they become apoplectic when you talk about the acoustic wave equation. And we hear about that. Because you propagate waves in a solid, they support multiple wave types. Right? Surface waves, shear waves, and the compressional waves that act more like sound waves. This is beginning to penetrate our world. We are beginning to do this. The algorithms for that are a little more diverse. There's more diversity of algorithm there. Um, you know, you will see finite difference methods, which come from kind of the industrial applications being pretty common. Uh, but finite element methods actually do creep in around the edges as well, which is something not very common for us in the acoustic world. There's almost no reason to do finite elements with an, a simple scalar hyperbolic PDE, except for complex boundaries. But we tend to just make smooth models, and so we don't do a lot of complex boundaries. What Jerome's doing is actually the spectral element stuff, which is actually a hybrid of kind of our high order finite difference methods with finite element methods which, I mean, is a highly engineered discipline to work in that space. But he actually puts his codes out there. I mean, you can download his codes. He actually makes them public domain. Um, a lot of the stuff that I would call old stuff, good old geophysics data processing, no, that stuff's still hanging in there. It's not going anywhere. We still run Kirchhoff migrations, which are basically simple kinematic mapping operators of the data. They don't solve PDEs. Well, they solve them in an asymptotic sense, but they don't solve them in anything like a complete sense. Ah, we still run the heck out of that stuff. We do tomographic calculations with simple kind of ray tracing algorithms. Yeah, there's some minor things that you do to make it a little better. You know, we still do, I mean, I think Sfera alluded to, uh, you know, hey, just transposing the dang data so you can look at it in a different orientation. <laughs> that can really break your back sometimes. Yeah, we're still doing that stuff. Um, well, what Sfera kind of told you about at the end of his talk was the fact that we do often pose our problems as optimization problems. Now, we may solve them in a very crummy way like one iteration of steepest descent, <laughs> for instance, which is about as crummy as you can get, well, other than zero. Um, a lot of that optimization I would call linear or quasi-linear. I mean, conjugate gradient methods are very common for us to use. Um, we have this application called full waveform inversion. You've certainly heard that buzzword if you've been around kind of the geophysics industry. I'm not going to go into the science of that for now, because from a computational perspective, it's just solving the forward problem a bunch of times. Uh, that's actually a nonlinear optimization problem, but we actually treat it as if it were locally linear. Right? We're not using general nonlinear optimi optimization techniques on that. You know, we get trapped in the nearest local minimum when we use that method, uh, which is interesting because you know, we know better than that. We know a lot of our problems are actually genuinely quite nonlinear, and we kind of just sweep it under the table and don't worry about that too much. Um, but no, that's the state of affairs. Uh, what we do not do a lot of we do not do a lot of exact solves of large linear systems, right? No finite elements, you know, not typically setting up problems as dense optimization or linear programming type problems. So we're not, we're not solving dense L1 or L2 problems. Just generally don't. They're just too damn expensive at the scale that we're using. Uh, there are people in the geophysics world that do database stuff. Generally, I try to kill that as fast as I can find it. Um, there are some old processing systems that are out there that have database-like constructs associated with them. God, I hope I can kill those things off before I'm done in this business. Actually, another thing we don't do very much of is double precision, right? And we don't do a heck of a lot with integers, either. So if you build me a machine, that, machine that's really good at double precision but has no particular advantage going to single precision, eh, it's kind of a loss for me, right? Because I don't actually do that much double precision. The guys doing the Helmholtz solvers are, right? So they're the one exception. If you're solving the Helmholtz equation, you're doing it in double precision. Um, well, like I said, finite elements is making some penetration into our world now, but when you truly go to things like unstructured grid methods, yeah, we just don't do a whole lot of that. I mean, I'm, I'm worried about this because there are aspects of the forward problem that you would say are very natural for unstructured grid methods 
because there are very small scale features in the Earth you want to know about that are embedded in very large scale features of the Earth. And the problem is traditional kind of grid construction methods and finite element things, eh, just don't, they're just a real pain. It takes you longer to generate the grid than solve the wave equation on the grid that you got. So it's natural that if you could come up with something like an unstructured grid method, you might get around some of the pain of grid construction. Uh, we haven't cracked that problem in our business. I mean, I think the guys that do fluid flow, they're miles ahead of us in that. Someday, somebody in our, in our world is going to wake up on that one. And again, we do very, very little fully nonlinear optimization. You know, very little simulated annealing, genetic algorithms, that kind of stuff. Very, very little of that. Not none, but very little. Okay, uh, here's a picture of full waveform inversion. Basically, what you should see in this is, this is the old blurry picture we used to get of objects in the subsurface. These are velocity perturbations in this case. This is the new picture we get by actually simulating and matching the wave field to the observed data and solving a quasi-linear inverse problem, matching the data to the observed wave field. And when you get that right, you can make amazingly detailed images of the subsurface. So that's actually been a very big consumer of Keith's machines that he buys, is we kind of burn them down running that application. Remember, uh, Scott told you that, and I think Sfera did too, it's not just about imaging the data, you have to construct the velocity model through which you image the data. So we backpropagate the waves, that has to be done through a model of the sound speed, where do you get that model of sound speed? Well, we get it by solving an inverse problem, either by you know, heuristic ways or by actually mathematically reasonably good ways. And FWI is that reasonably mathematically good way of doing that. OK. Well, this is just kind of a picture of what you know, the world of modeling looks like. And at least I showed you some 3D pictures. Uh, so we build these nice, intricate models of subsurface. And we like to propagate waves in them and see how well do they kind of match what we observe in the field, and then how well can we use them to help engineer our seismic acquisition experiments. I think Scott and Sfera covered that pretty well. Um, all right, so data density, because I think, I think they kind of kicked the ball down the road to me to cover that one. So about 20 years ago, I kind of did back of the envelope calculation last night. We collected about 160,000 seismic traces per square kilometer in a standard marine seismic acquisition. So when Sfera showed you that narrow, skinny little boat that towed six streamers and you know, kind of did its thing in the ocean, it was getting order of magnitude correct, 160,000 traces per square kilometer. If you look at what we're doing now, particularly with ocean bottom recording systems, we're up well north of millions of traces per square kilometer, approaching 10 million traces per square kilometer. We'll probably do some ourselves kind of in 2017 that break that barrier and approach kind of 12 million traces per square kilometer. Land data density, land seismic is more expensive because you got to put boots on the ground, you can't drag it all behind you in a nice big efficient ship. You actually have to go walk there, right? And you got to pay people to do it. So land seismic is always more expensive than marine seismic per traces per square kilometer, if you will. So 20 years ago, land seismic data only had a few tens of thousands of traces per square kilometers, actually quite sparse in terms of, you know, there's a wave field out there that is rattling the surface of the Earth, and you would like to sense it as densely as you can, because that directly correlates to how good an image you can make. But we really didn't have that many recordings of that wave field 20 years ago on, on shore. Now, actually, we're collecting surveys for exploration when we're trying to cover large areas. Uh, those are often kind of in the neighborhood of a million traces per square kilometer. And there are a few places on the planet where we've now exceeded 40 million traces per square kilometer onshore. And uh, you know, when people talk about next generation recording systems, they're going to probably raise that number, if not an order of magnitude, another half order of magnitude. So that stuff's going to go up. So when I said, you know, even with the downturn in the industry, data density is going up, that's what's going on. OK. Just a picture of what data density buys you. So here's a sparse data set, slightly less sparse data set and then the finest data set. And maybe kind of the way for an untrained eye to look at it is, well, all these details that you see in here, like this and kind of that disruption there and kind of all the subtle details in there, they're probably real, actually. Even now, they're not focused well enough to be absolutely sure what they are. But, you know, this is hopeless. You can't, can't really see it. This is getting there. It's starting to get better. But you actually do pay money for those higher resolution images. You, you do want that stuff. Okay, now we're about to slip into opinion. So now, you know, hey, we're approaching the end of the day. Everybody's relaxed. I'm ready to seed you with a bunch of very poorly founded opinions. Um, if anything, see if any of it resonates with you. I suspect some of you say I'm absolutely crazy. And, and actually, I, it wouldn't be the first time I've ever been accused of that. Um, so I think I've seen at least six computing paradigms in the last 25 years, starting with mini computers and array processors, all the way up to what I would call the current state, which I'm not actually sure what the heck to call it. 
right? It's sort of this hybrid of cluster computing with distributed MPP type paradigm with accelerators bolted on to the back of that. You know, it's kind of this kind of heterogeneous thing, but actually I would say, despite all its heterogeneity, it's actually quite homogeneous, right? I mean, there isn't a heck of a lot of other alternatives that I see out there, right? There isn't some bizarre other programming model that a machine goes with, right? There's no connection machine equivalent today where somebody comes up and says, forget this vector machine crap, I'm going to give you a fine-grained, you know, SIMD machine, right? I don't know what it would be, but there is no competitor to what I would say that amorphous current state that we have is. I don't think that's a good thing. Uh, I was having a conversation with somebody earlier today where they were saying, hey, I need a way to make things more homogeneous. And I was thinking, no, no, exactly the opposite. We need people experimenting with more crazy ideas out there and find out if any of them are any good. Um, hey, the good news for us geophysicists are, I think our problems are just trivial. When you really come down to it, the problems we're trying to solve are just simulation of physics. It's actually pretty easy physics. It's linear physics. The inverse problems are mildly nonlinear. Maybe some of them are a little worse than mildly nonlinear. But actually, the forward problems are all... When you, when you talk about hard algorithms, they're not. They're trivial algorithms. Because every single one of those paradigms, we made good use of it. Every single one of them. I, I have no idea what's coming next, quite frankly. I mean, I'm talking about two years from now or three years from now. I mean, I heard a lot of the questions sort of through the day. And people are asking, what if you substitute this card for that card or this network for that work? I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. Not the minor tweaks to the current state. I'm talking about who's going to show up with something radical. And everybody goes, oh, holy crap, look at that. That thing's really bizarre. Yes, I am even looking at that stupid D-Wave machine. I don't think that's what's next, right? <laughs> but but uh, so I'm just, to, just to let you know I am aware of there are some crazy people out there like me. Um, what I would say is if you want to communicate effectively about computing, you've got to know what you're actually trying to do. You know, why are you investing in that damn machine? What does it do for you? that really determines what your attitude about all this stuff is going to be. So, you know, if I'm talking to somebody that has a very different economic model, if you will, of why they buy the computer, we're going to be at loggerheads, right? We're not going to be able to agree on anything because we're fundamentally using it for something very different. So, um, some of my personal biases. Way, way back when I first learned Fortran in 1977, uh, the, oh, I don't know, probably second week of class, teacher came out, I was a Jesuit high school, Catholic priest comes out, and he says, I want you to write a program that you design the algorithm for. I'm not, don't read it out of a book, you just design it to sort a list of 15,000 integers that, you know, that will be presented to you in random order. Everybody writes an N squared sort, right? That's what happened. No, nobody who's a sophomore in high school is smart enough to figure out one of the N log N sorts from first principles as a sophomore in high school. If they are, they're not in this room because they're smart enough to have made a real living. Um, and, and so, no, I mean, I wasn't either, right? So I wrote an N squared sort. And on the machine that I had at the time, I think I was telling somebody, the way you could tell if it was working was you tuned into 560 on the AM dial. It was a 560 kilohertz clock cycle machine. So you could tell if it was running or not by listening to the noise on an AM radio. Uh, so yeah, I wrote an N squared sort. It took 45 minutes to sort 15,000 integers with you know, something like a bubble sort. And then the next day, when everybody comes back and presents their, uh, you know, their results, you know, he goes, okay, now I'm going to show you how to do it. And he goes through a description of quicksort. And we're all just like, what in the heck is he talking about? All right, here's the code. Just go run it. And you run it, it runs in 15 seconds. Holy crap, right? Now you think, this guy's a genius, right? Uh, so what that proves is if you have a fundamental revolution in the algorithm, I don't care what computer architecture you use, a good algorithm wins every time if it really is a good algorithm. Okay, so then I took, you know, three years later, I went to college. And in college, I got an account on the computer, and it was like a DECVAX 780, right? So uh, I said, wow, why don't I try my old bubble sort, quick sort test on the VAX? Guess what happens? They both run in 10 seconds. <laughs> All right? Because just the overhead of loading the stupid program and initializing the integers, it's only 15,000 integers, right? So <laughs> then you can sort it with a bubble sort in 15 seconds on a VAX, right? So then, actually, if you've got a fast enough computer, that beats all the work on the algorithm every time, right? So I told you I was going to contradict myself, right? That's the first one of these contradictions. You got to know which regime you're playing in, right? If you're playing in that space where a fundamental change in the algorithm is really going to win the day, don't worry about the computer so much. If you're playing in the space where actually there is no more algorithm available to you, that's the end of what you're going to do in the algorithm space, well, then you get in this game of trying to talk about faster computers. In geophysics, yeah, I think we're definitely here. 
I'm not sure we should be. I'm not sure that's the right answer. Maybe we should actually be in that upper space. But yeah, as an industry, I think we haven't figured out how to do that. Um, more memory is always good. Right? It's, it's just always good. Right? I, mean, I, I don't care per process, total, across the machine, distributed. Whichever way you can give it to me, I want it. Uh, I love the Cray 2. That was my second favorite machine. Because remember what it could do. It could read two words, not two bytes, two words from memory, do a multiply, an add, and write one back in one clock. Right? That's what a Cray 2 could do. That's why it was a damn nice machine. It was a damn expensive machine. It was a damn nice machine. Um, uh, now, I, I already showed you that I violated this advice myself. A computer's just an appliance, right? It's, it's not a temple. Don't worship these damn things. Every one of these brilliant machines that you guys are playing with right now, in five years' time, you're going to be dissing them. You're going to be saying, man, that thing was a piece of junk, right? Why did we ever use such a terrible piece of junk as that? Look at this great new thing we have now. Yeah, don't get trapped up in treating the thing as, as a temple. It's not. What I tell people is computer's a toaster. Right? It's really nothing more than that. It's a device for making a product. And you've got to know what you're making the product for. If you're making the product for your own consumption, that dictates what kind of toaster you're going to buy. If you're running a restaurant, that might dictate another kind of toaster you're going to buy. OK. So kind of two end members of that spectrum. One is the computer is part of my brain. Right? I'm trying to figure out how to solve a problem. I don't know how to solve it yet. And I'm going to use the computer to help me do that. If, that, if you're on that end of the spectrum, what I would say is you're probably changing the code all the time, right? Because you're in the middle of debugging the damn code all the time, continually. That's the world you're in. And you're probably willing to experiment with all sorts of paradigms. And it's fine. It's good. That's what you want to be doing. Um, you probably, if, if, if you are managing a system of people doing that, you probably should not man you, sh you shouldn't be managing utilization, right? Because actually the critical resource you have is people's brains, not the computer, right? So if the computer is not 100% busy, what it means is the people are 100% busy. And they're a hell of a lot more precious than that stupid box. So if you're in that world, don't, don't, be, don't be going and telling your managers, we achieve 98% utilization or whatever. That, what that means is you don't have enough computer. You're screwing up. You are mismanaging the resource. You don't have enough computer. Now the flip side is, if you are printing money with the computer, that's what Sphera is doing. He's actually doing a little bit of both. Nobody is pure on either ends of the spectrum, right? There's always, you're always doing a mixture of both. Sfera is more in this world than I am. I'm more in that world than he is. But there's elements for both of us. Um, if you're solving the same problem many, many times for dollars, well, <laughs> utilization is more important. I mean, if someone will give me a device that prints $20 bills, I mean, real ones, good ones, you know, fungible ones that I can spend, um, I, I want to run the thing 24 7, right? I'm, I'm going to turn it off, right? Um, so messing around with it, <laughs> changing the code, changing, you know, no, 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 we have to manage this, right? You're going to hear a lot more about that stuff. You have admitted to yourself, though, that now you're in a margin business, right? So you have to know, am I in a margin business or am I not in a margin business? If you're doing fundamental science, I think you're not in a margin business. Although I must admit, I'm not an academic, and it may be that when you're writing papers and trying to get tenure and all that kind of stuff and get just ahead of the other guy, it may be that Jerome, with all of his big global seismic you know, waveform, waveform inversions, when he's competing with the other people publishing in that space, he might actually be in a margin business on publications. right? Not dollars, but publications. But you've got to understand where you are in that space. Otherwise, you don't really know how to communicate why you're buying the machine. Uh, OK, graphics. Graphics is a big problem for us. This is a modern picture. I think Sfera might have shown you pictures kind of like this. Um, it's actually from a four-dimensional data set. But of course, I have no way of showing you a four-dimensional data set in any meaningful way on a flat screen. Uh, that's actually a problem, right? So I'm using a technique that actually would have been used in the 1960s. Uh, that's not so good, right? I'd like to have a technique from, well, maybe the 90s anyway. <laughs> Maybe a little later than that. But actually, this is modern. We still do this. I, I guarantee you, if I go to Sfera's company on Monday and he shows me the latest results of something he's doing, it might look like that. It, I'll give him credit. It'll look better than that. But actually, the graphics will be the same. It'll be on a 2D screen. It'll be folding a multi-dimensional entity down onto two dimensions in a way that understanding what's really in there is quite tough. All right. Well, OK. You can make things a little better than that, because here is something that's actually three plus a half dimensional, because there's two things encoded into the display. There's an underlying physical property model and then a wave field on top of that. Yeah, forget the equations. I just cut and paste this out of a talk I was giving. That's not part of the graphics. That's, that's actually in PowerPoint. It's, it's not actually part of the graphics. Um, so OK, maybe that's a little better. But 
Why has graphics made so little progress? Computing has come a factor of better than a million in my career, and graphics has come almost nowhere. That, that, that's got to be a wrong answer. So we probably ought to be working on that. OK, now the real rants begin. Um, why is it now true that it is just about impossible to find somebody that is both an excellent scientist and an excellent computationalist? Why is that hard? Jerome is probably the living exception I know of. I think he knows how to do both really damn well, although I think he gets a lot of help from slave grad student labor. But, but I'll give him credit. Maybe he's the one person on the planet that can do it, um, and, you know, in our kind of geophysical disciplines. Um, and the problem is, I don't even know how to convince people to try to learn both spaces. When I was in grad school, and I think even when Sparrow was in grad school, he's, he's, he's starting to be an old timer himself even now. Um, no, you were nobody if you didn't talk megaflops and you know, peak utilization. If you didn't talk that kind of stuff, as well as talking the science, you, know, you were second rate. You were nobody. Now, no, 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 the scientists mostly want to do it in MATLAB. They're, they're, I mean, they're just not interested. I mean, you, you, can't convince, you can't show them, look at this cool stuff. Look at my old Cray assembler language stuff. Isn't that interesting? Look, I got the machine running at full utilization on this loop. <laughs> they're not interested. Um, What's worse is, I don't know how to convince anybody this is a problem, right? I think it's, it's just not possible. So we've kind of diverged in this world where people choose computational specialties as their core expertise, and then they stay away from the leading edge of science, or they want to be on the leading edge of science. They say, the computation stuff, I kind of, you know, it's, it's too complicated. I want to do it, right? It's too hard. Uh, maybe it is too hard, right? Maybe genuinely this just reflects the reality that computing isn't getting easier. Um, so maybe we're, maybe we're, you know, I think we're like the makers of fine Swiss watches, right? We're making ever more intricate, ever more beautiful, ever more complex Swiss watches when we write these high performance codes. But the ability of anybody to come along and either repair it or use it for something else or manufacture a thousand of them at scale cheaply, no, those things don't exist. Uh, and <laughs> why the hell does it take so long to compile things now? I mean, it took about a minute to compile something on that old LSI 430 machine that I listened to on 560 on the AM dial. Eh, you know, kind of 30 seconds to a minute to compile something. I've got a multi-petaflop installation. I should be compiling in under a microsecond. Now, nah, it still takes 30 seconds to a minute on a small code, right? If it's a big code, it'll take, you know, 10 minutes to compile it. What in the heck is going on with that? I'm sure there's a reason, and a computer scientist would give me the reason. I, frankly, I don't want to hear it. I want it to compile faster. Um, so this one is not entirely true, but I think it is still partly true. We have not learned the lesson of the Industrial Revolution. You know, what was the most important thing about the Industrial Revolution? One, you didn't, know how to build, you didn't have to know how to build the entire switch watch yourself. You might have known how to make one gear. And somebody else knew how to make another gear, and somebody else knew how to make the time face, and somebody else knew how to make the crystal, and somebody else knew how to make you know, the, the spring mechanism. And at the end, you could build a million Swiss watches for 10 cents each. right? But we are all like the custom Swiss watch maker. We all build our own little Swiss watch out of totally non-interchangeable parts. OK, yeah, FFTs are interchangeable, and MPI is interchangeable, and stuff like that. But we're only kind of at one level. right? If you look at every piece of stuff that is built in this room, it is built by a machine that was 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 built by a machine. I don't know how many hierarchical levels deep. A lot. Right? If we had to build all this stuff with nothing but hand tools, it would take all of us a year plus to do it. Right? I mean, it would be terrible. But this stuff is all junk. It was stamped out in a factory rapid fire. Right? Why, why have we not seen that economy of scale in the creation of our products, our software, our applications? It doesn't seem to have happened. There has not been an industrial revolution yet. We should have machines that program machines that program machines that program machines that ultimately execute you know, the science. But we're at most, most one or two levels into that hierarchy. I think it's because, and, and every one of you are case in point, because you're probably thinking, ah, forget that stuff. I don't want to use that other guy's junk. It's a bunch of junk. I'm going to need to modify it. I'm going to just do it myself. Right? If you want it done right, you have to do it yourself. I don't know how many times I said that to myself when I was young. If you want it done right, you got to do it yourself. I was young and stupid and wrong. No, actually what you want is friends to help you. That's really a lot better way. But I don't think we're very good at making friends to help us, right? I mean, we, we don't seem to be as good at it as somebody who is making tires for your car, right? Because they have a huge support mechanism that allows them to do that final step and add their value and that's it. 
We don't have anything like that. Um, you know, as the complexity of what we're doing has exploding, we really need that leverage of the Industrial Revolution, and we're not getting it. I don't know what to do. I'm, if, if you take away nothing else, ponder why our task is getting more complicated, not less complicated. Because in almost every other industry that takes over the world, at least in its time, they found a way to make it actually less complicated for the people doing it. Not a way to make it more intricate. The Swiss watchmakers did not succeed. They failed. It was Timex and you know, Sanyo and whatever. They ruled the world because they found a way to make pretty good timepieces, absolutely dirt cheap, absolutely reproducible, as many as you wanted, as fast as you wanted. Right? They didn't try to just run faster making Swiss watches by hand. That was a losing game. What the hell happened to static executables? Why did that go away? I mean, there was a real good reason for that. It's because you could just give somebody an executable, and as long as the machine was of reasonably the same revision, it would just run. Now, that like, doesn't happen at all. It's a total disaster. And who remembers demand page virtual memory? Nobody? Earl does. Do you remember what it was for? Very simple reason. You could let multiple people use the machine at the same time. Right? When I was at, I mean, I, I went to Stanford as a grad student, geophysics department. We had a convex at the time. It's a nice machine for its day. It was, a, you know, it was an air-cooled mini cray. Um, the load average, none of you probably look at load averages on machines anymore because it better be one or less. Right? Well, OK, I guess it's counting the number of cores now. So it better be n cores or less. Um, oh, no, we were running load average of 8 plus all the time because you had all these grad students who were trying to feed their research in all at the same time, fighting with each other. It was great fun, hacking each other. We had a lot of fun. It worked. I mean, the machine did not actually get much less productive. It got a little less productive in aggregate because there is some overhead to running demand page virtual memory. But it didn't get dramatically less productive. That, um, um, we had to agree to fit within virtual memory, right? If the aggregate work didn't fit within virtual memory, okay, everything came to a screeching halt. But it didn't have to fit in physical memory, right? And not even any one person's stuff, and certainly not even the aggregate had to fit in physical memory. Nobody out here is running multi-user machines anymore, I would speculate. You're giving somebody a physical partition of the machine for a defined length of time, and they are owning it. And that's actually a pretty damn inefficient way to use these machines. Who, who, which computer company let demand page virtual memory die? I know who it is, actually. It's SGI. That is SGI's fault. They let that die. <laughs> Yeah, except he made up for it with the other brilliances of his machines. OK, so I'm almost done, I promise. I know I'm over time. But uh, you guys don't want to come to the panel discussion anyway, do you? Um, I think a real potential future for the increase in the demand that we in the geophysics world see for high performance computing is linking up to the reservoir engineers. So when I said we don't do many nonlinear optimizations, I was lying a little bit. We are starting to break into this world of doing stochastic inversions on seismic. Now, we're doing it in very, very simplified physics. We're not doing it with the full acoustic or elastic wave equation. We're doing it with what we call the convolutional model. Right? Very, very simplified model of the physics. But we actually do generate Markov chains of potentially millions of realizations of the subsurface and then just compare them to the seismic. Right? And it actually can bounce around in the objective function space almost arbitrarily. Right? And then we match it to the seismic and choose the subset of the ones that we tried that seem to fit the best. And the next step is connect that to the guys that are doing re reservoir simulation. Because they're kind of doing mentally the same thing. They're trying to figure out how to populate reservoir models. What happens in reservoir modeling is they spend a lot of time, like a year, building this fabulous reservoir model. And then what they do is they say, now let's try to match the history of the oil field. And they run their forward simulation. What happens is it doesn't match. And they go, crap, now what do we do? Well, maybe we need a fault over here. Maybe we need to change the porosity over here. We've got to change the permeability over there. And then somebody goes and modifies the model. Hopefully it doesn't take a year this time. And they run it again. Hey, that's a little better. OK, do some more of that, right? Actually, what I'd like to do is just give them Earth property models from my stochastic realizations of the Earth and say, why don't you just try this million realizations of the Earth through your reservoir simulator? So what's going to happen is, actually, I think they're going to be running a lot more reservoir simulations. Now, actually, those guys do dense, large, linear solves. They do solve more nonlinear problems than we do. Than we do. Their physics is nonlinear. Um, so actually, if that comes to fruition, where we're actually generating realizations for reservoir simulators, and uh, we're going to probably be doing a lot more reservoir simulation. 
Right? But they need us because they don't have any way of getting, other than just guessing and putting in faults and screwing around manually, they don't have a way of suggesting alternative models. We have that. We can give them alternative models. We're beginning to know how to do that. So if that comes to pass, you know, the demand for computing is just absolutely astronomical in that world. But if I, when I talked to my, well, I kind of had a jam session with one of our absolute fanatical reservoir engineers. And we came out of that jam session pretty jazzed, thinking, hey, this, this could actually work. I don't know where we're going to get the computing, but this would actually work. It would solve a lot of the problems in their world. Okay, so that, this is the end, I promise. Um, I went to our absolutely most fanatical programmer, who is willing to do CUDA, who is willing to look at bizarre architectures. He won't do that VHDL stuff for FPGAs. He won't go that far. But he's as fanatical as we got it. So Keith knows what the initials mean. I think Scott probably knows what the initials are. I, I won't mention his name. None of you will know him anyway. He's from Albania, almost an Olympic quality cyclist. Um, so he's a maniac. So I asked him if you had 15 seconds to sum up your entire view of high performance computing, what would it be? Performance is everything. Right? <laughs> I said, okay, fine. I expected nothing less from him. I said, okay, now if you had 15 more seconds to ask for something, actually, and I, I told him about this talk and I said, I'm going to relay his request to you, the HPC community, what would you ask for? Well, a few more tools to help. <laughs> okay, I'll leave you there. You showed the various pictures, and my huh? question for you is, is uh, so how accurate was it, and how do you know? <laughs> okay. No, those are, so by, what I would say is... And, how do you, and, and, and maybe it was accurate enough. So yeah, not quite accurate enough, because in fact that is a picture with a, probably from 2006 now. Um, and we have done better in subsequent iterations of working on that. Um, it, it's interesting. I'm going to give you a philosophical answer, which I'm not sure will do you much good. So I was sitting at a conference among people doing seismic inversion. And I, I did seismic inversion kind of as a grad student, but then I got into much broader interests. And so I'm not religious about kind of the data matching inversion model versus what, what I call the direct inverse model. Right? There's sort of two camps in geophysics. Those who think that there ought to be a mathematical way of formulating the problem that you could just directly estimate the Earth properties, not estimate, determine the Earth properties from the observations. Eh? One way. The other is do this forward simulation and matching stuff. Right? Um, so if you believe the data matching guys and say how well did my simulated data match the observed data, eh, 80%. Right? So there's 20% of the data that's still unexplained by that criteria. Now, if you say, is there an operation that just directly tells you what the Earth really is, and how close did I get to that? Miles away. Miles away. Not even close. Because there's still a lot of uncertainty in that picture. What makes us, remember, what I would say is we don't really solve, op, mathematically we solve optimization problems. But for the business, we solve what a business school professor taught me the word, satisfaction problems. I just needed a satisfactory answer. I didn't need the best answer. I don't even know how to define what the best answer actually is. I just need an answer that allows me to drill a well and produce oil and gas. So I got a satisfactory answer. Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah. So that was a roundabout answer to your question. But yeah, we still don't match the data that well. We don't match it terribly, but we don't match it perfectly. And so we're probably still a long way from that. Jerome is closer. On the global scale, he can actually match his data probably coming close to 95% now. Oh, I wish we had a day to discuss some of your points because it would be a long philosophical argument. But things have changed and nothing has changed. So he had a, a VAX 11780, maybe 785 with two processes and a floating point accelerator. Yep. And that's no different than a node with a GPU. <laughs> yeah. Or so you have a thousand VAX 11780s. Yep with FPSs on a, on a current system. Yep. And that's all it is. Yep. Uh, the CM5 was a lovely machine. I had serial number one, ah. 544 processes, had great software libraries.
but it was really a very limited functionality uh -huh. machine. Uh -huh. Good. So it you clearly wasn't meant to be general some purpose. Some things very well, yeah. but very few things very well. Well, the, so, nice, the nice thing for us was it solved that linear hyperbolic PDE problem just beautifully. So, yep. so you will remember what PRISM is. Yes. That was the best debugger ever created. Yes. No one has exceeded that in my mind even up to this day. Thank you. Could you, do you own the IP to it? Can you resurrect it? Well, could you, buy, look, they probably sell it to you for a dollar. Well, fine. Look, if I, I, will, I will make a case to my management to have Keith pay a million dollars if we could have Prism back. Because here, it was the one key, it could do two key things. It could generate graphics on the fly as your code is running, and you could debug fully optimized code. It was absolutely stunning. It was the best thing that Thinking Machines did. I ran it on Sun workstations long after the connection machines were gone. So if you can find a way to bring Prism back, I'll convince my management to buy it. It's the best debugger ever written. Can you elaborate on what Mr. FH Cyclist was referring to for his wish list? What better tools or a few more tools to help? Well, I suspect in this case the gentleman was being quite specific. As he was sitting there looking at his CUDA code, for a particular, actually nonlinear fluid flow problem, which is nastier, because he was actually working for the damn engineers for a minute, <laughs> not working for Scott, so Scott, Scott, may cover up your ears, <laughs> yeah. Um, he was doing a little extracurricular activity, and he was looking at his CUDA code, and because it was a little frustrating, because it had like integer stuff in it too, right? It has both integer and floating point stuff in it. Um, he was having trouble figuring out how to debug this thing. So I think he was just frustrated that, you know, I don't know how to debug this thing. I don't know how to figure out how to make it right. Um, and he felt like he was in kind of uncharted territory, right? He's, he was trying to be a Swiss watchmaker without the proper training to build a Swiss watch, and it was kind of frustrating. Um, you know, more generally, I think it is, you know, it kind of depends on what, back to that kind of, what is the computer there for, right? Is it there to help you think and solve problems the first time, or is it there to run an implementation of something of economic value many, many times. Um, in his case, he was way up in that first part. I mean, he was trying to solve a problem for the first time. And so I think it's how do you make the act of embedding an algorithm into one of these machines at an acceptable level of performance? Not an optimum level of performance, just an acceptable level of performance. Fast, like now, like today, dang it, before I have to get on my bike and ride home. Right? Not tomorrow, not the next day, not next week, not having to call up somebody on the phone in California and tell them how to, you know, get them to tell me how to do it. It's like, now. Because, right? I mean, I, I don't know, if, I mean, personally, I don't know if you write a lot of code and have to debug it, and, it's, and if you're ever on the frontier of that. You know, what you want is instant gratification on that, right? That, that's why I was complaining about the compile time. Because my polar opposite in programming is somebody who will spend a month writing a program and will not invoke the compiler until he is done actually basically proving to himself by compiling it and running it in his own mind, as near as I can tell, that it's correct. And his codes always compile and execute correctly the first time. Right? If he ever has a bug at all, he's crushed. I mean, he's just absolutely crushed if he has a bug at compile time. And he's actually pretty devastated if he has a bug at runtime. Whereas me, no, I just slather a bunch of crap in the computer and I just start running the compiler on it. And I make the compiler comb out all the bugs. And then, oh, it takes me 100 executions of the code before it even makes it halfway through the first time. You're somewhere on that spectrum, right? I'm, I'm definitely at one end, I think. And, and he's definitely at the other end, right? So you're somewhere on that spectrum. And so depending on where you are, that's what kind of tools you need. That's why I bitched about compilers. Because the compiler is what helps me think. Right? So I need to, fast. I want, I want that brain to be fast. Right? Those neurons better fire quick. Not everybody's going to see it that way. Other people are going to see it different ways. What they may need is a good editor and a good way of maybe kind of pre, I don't know what he would, I don't, I mean, I'm not one of those people. I don't know how to describe what tool they would want. But I would imagine they would want something that would help them visualize the entire body of code all at once. And so they'd understand all the interfaces. Oh, by the way, this person He's just a C programmer. He's not a C++ programmer. That, that person's a C++ programmer. Uh, I learned that I'm never going to learn C++ from him because he's the best C programmer I know. 
And he finally said, well, the modern world is going to C++. I'm going to need to go to C++, because everybody else seemingly is doing it. So he went and bought that big, thick C++ book. Right? I guess it's whatever the standard, big, fat C++ book is. I said, OK, I'm going to watch you. Joe. Joe Dellinger is his name. I'll watch you, Joe. And if you actually say, this isn't so bad. You should learn this. Then, OK, maybe I will suck it up and figure out how to do this. And a week later, he walked down the hall, and he took that big, fat book and just <laughs> threw it in the trash. He said, I'm never going to do this. This is hopeless. Right? So I said, OK, that solves a problem for me, because you're way better at this than me. And if you think you can't do it, there's no way I'm going to do it. Um, so it kind of depends on where you are on that spectrum, right? So I think in this case of this gentleman asking for better tools, I think his request is actually pretty straightforward. Um, but I think it is more transcendent than that, right? Whatever it is that you do to add value, right now I kind of feel like a lot of you probably feel like you're having to kind of make it up as you go, cobble it together, make phone calls, read stuff off the internet, try stuff, but it's not very systematized, right? I mean, Thinking Machines put out some excellent books my favorite was Getting Started in CM Fortran. And they basically showed you how to write the core of all the algorithms that the machine would execute with any decent performance. Just in a little thin pamphlet, that's big. So if you, thim you thumb through that pamphlet, and if you find your algorithm in there, you're in business. You're ready to go. You know what to do. Right? If you don't find your algorithm in there, go get a different machine. And the machine isn't going to run it. Right? But I got to like page two, and there was my code. Right? This is what I needed. So. It was perfect. But I, I mean, NVIDIA doesn't make a getting started in CUDA, as near as I can tell. If they do, I haven't seen it. And, and this gentleman didn't have it on his desk, right? Um, you know, I don't so think. All right, well, good deal. Um, <laughs> talk to Keith. He knows who this person is. He'll, he'll set you up. So, yeah. I enjoyed the talk. And it's going to the skills gap. It was sort of interesting that many of us have throughout this conference talked about MATLAB and the graduate students coming out are great at MATLAB, but if you give them anything with a blinking cursor and state writing code, um, yeah. they look at you blankly. So I think partly that, so this is a kind of a comment, sort of reflects that perhaps we all are crazy, but we're all getting older. Yep. And unfortunately, a lot of the people coming in aren't coming in with the skills. So th that kind of leads me to a question. Who needs to be the champion, or who are we expecting to be the Henry Ford for this industrial revolution and put together the libraries and the lower level areas of the code so that we can teach them how to put, assemble this and we can actually get something done? So again, I'm going to answer in a way that won't satisfy you. Um, way back in the m mid to late 80s, the geophysics world actually was one of the larger consumers outside of the classified world of computing. And so all the computer vendors would go to the main geophysical conference every year. And they'd have a big booth. The other thing, they'd throw big parties and the food was great. And as a grad student, this was like excellent news because I was on a very limited budget, so the free food I could get was, was good. And what I learned at the time was, well, Intel, you know, had a booth, right? And they actually had like their old hypercube systems. What I learned was Intel is a hardware company. They don't, they don't really make software. Yeah, grudgingly, they'll give you a compiler. Kind of, right? But they're not a software company. They're not a total solutions company, right? They're, they just want to sell silicon, as near as I can tell. If they had their druthers, that's all they'd sell. It's just that you won't actually buy it if they don't give you at least some kind of piece of crap compiler to go with it. Um, so I think it's not them, right? I think it is not the people making the bare metal. Somebody's got to come somewhere in between. I mean, the unfortunate thing was, I think companies like Thinking Machines, and there were, I mean, depending on what you were working on, there were other companies that kind of tried to play that space as well. They did not overly work the metal. What they did was found a clever way of using semi-existing metal. I mean, Thinking Machines eventually mutated into having custom stuff built for them. Um, but uh, you know, they weren't super concerned about the metal. They were more concerned about the human-machine interface aspects of it. So they wrote excellent compilers, and they wrote excellent debuggers, and they provided software prototypes and stuff. But what happened was, as a business, that model failed. Right? That was not doable as a business, because uh, Thinking Machines made some other, I think, blunders in their strategy. Um, but, but there were other companies that were kind of in that space, too. It wasn't just Thinking Machines that kind of couldn't make that model work. So I, do, I don't know who does it. I blame my alma mater, Stanford. 
it should be the computer science department at Stanford that's solving this problem for us. They should be producing grad students who know how to write compilers and middleware and et cetera. They should be coming, every PhD that comes out of there who has any focus on high performance computing, which is probably none now, but maybe there's a few, should be coming out and saying, my thesis shows you how to program this class of machines from a high level construct like MATLAB and get 50 plus percent of the fundamental performance. That's a PhD in computer science in my mind. Whatever the heck they're doing, I, I don't know. It's probably on my phone or something. I mean, I don't know. It doesn't do me any good. Okay. okay. But the era of Swiss watches in software is still going on. Uh, well, that's what this gentleman's doing. He's trying to build a Swiss watch. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, yeah, Intel found out how to give us an unlimited number of computational units, at, uh, basically free. I mean, I don't know why. I mean, I don't. I guess they have to charge us for something. They probably charge us for advertising at some point. But it fundamentally costs them nothing to make those things. The, the incremental cost of making another one is zero, right? They can give us as much computational capacity as we want. But we don't have the ability to leverage that in a way that recognizes that we should have also had our own industrial revolution, where the ability to write scientific applications that perform satisfactorily. Not, I don't give a crap about optimally, not really, because I'm not in that lower space of I'm printing money with my machine. I just want a satisfactory computational speed, because as soon as I'm done, I got to do another one. I got to build another one, right? a new application. So it's kind of time to solution that's more important. And Sfera did have an element of that too, right? I mean, what he said, part of his strategy is being ahead of the competition and delivering solutions. So he actually has to gravitate up into that space some as well, not just printing $20 bills with his computer. So I, I, I blame everybody downstream, everybody in the compilers and downstream. That's whom I'm blaming, including us. But we it was the early part. omen with the thinking machines in Jurassic Park. You know, so it would be geophysics in the next one, and we go, we've got to go out of business. But I can make a comment, I think, to, to this statement of few more tools, because, and I give kudos to Intel, because they're actually funding it. For, I mean, we are part of a group that have pushed for something like this, but that is basically compiler-level tools that will generate the forward and the adjoint operator, so they pass a dot product test. And if you go back to these equations that I showed, I mean, that's what we need to run inversions and push beyond the sort of simplistic optimization we're doing today. And also at various target level uh, architectures. But for me, that is a big problem that, yeah, we have a guy like this as well and, and you know, a small handful, but you, you have to find a way to get to an AMD accelerator and an NVIDIA one and integrated Intel thing and, and do that with a push. So I think it's possible to tap into the guys that print money, like Intel, to, and have them actually fund it. But it's, and it's work done by academics, but not at Stanford, at the Imperial College, uh, these guys that I'm referring to. So it's out there. I would like to see more of that, because I think that's going to help us bridge the MATLAB to HPC gap, which is indeed the, the big worry that we have, because we're still run by some Jurassic Park people like myself and then some colleagues that, you know, we're all out... Soon we'll be out of the business. Sarah's the youngest yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have. I mean, there's people. My generation is maybe the youngest ones that, that do both. And I, I would say we also have an over reliance on two or three people that do all of this stuff that I showed you of moving codes onto the XC system and, and so on. And the low level stuff, yes, there's plenty of people you can get in to do that. But to combine the physics with that should be in a compiler. Uh, there are some hope out there, but I think it's not uh, you know well known as uh, to, to the wider industry.